Hey everyone, welcome to our channel. My name's Kyle. I'm Jason. And we're here to talk to you today about the latest Steve Vai record, Inviolate, released on his own Favored Nations record label. So, uh, giving a quick overview of the album. Obviously, it's been a little while since he released what I guess you'd call a completely original album. Like He did Modern Primitive in 2016, I think, which was a bunch of rehashes of old, like, flexible era tunes. Mm -hmm. And I think the last one he had before that was, I forget the name of the record, Story of Light. Yeah, Story right? of Light. Yep. 2012, 2013. Yeah, that was the, uh, the second part of the uh, the trilogy. Yeah. As yet unfinished trilogy, but right. we'll talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, his most recent record, I think since that album, with all completely new original material, uh, released February this year, I forget the exact date, February 4th, I think, uh, on his own record label, Favored Nations, which he's been running, I think, since the late 90s. He's had a long... Yeah, it's been out uh, quite a while. The, the label's been active for quite a while now. Yeah, but anyways, that's what we're talking about today. So um, I guess as an initial overview, Jason, what did you think about Inviolate? I thought it was an interesting list and an interesting record. Um, I've kind of found, for me anyway, and I don't know if this is the same for you, because obviously we're both guitar players and we come from that kind of school of the 80s shredder, uh, instrumental guitar heroics. Um, I find that the older I get, I kind of have gotten away from the guitar-centric instrumental record. And it's sure. weird. I can appreciate a good solo. I can certainly appreciate a good instrumental tune, but I've kind of gotten away, by and large, from the, you know, need, need it to shred, which, you know, not that I don't love it. Uh, so it was interesting going into this Vi record because, um, to be totally honest, I wasn't a huge fan, as much of a Vi fan as I am, I wasn't a huge fan of his last few releases. So I would kind of went in with an open mind, wanted to see where, you know, he's at in 2022. Obviously... Any record that comes out in this day and age is going to be a response in some way, shape, or form to COVID and mm -hmm. musicians kind of being locked up for the last couple of years and not being able to tour. So um, I, I went into it with an open mind. There were certainly things I really enjoyed. There were some things that I didn't enjoy as much, which I'm sure we'll get into more. But uh, overall, I thought it, it was a solid record for, for what it is. Yeah, definitely. I, I do agree with you on the point that, you know, and I don't know if this is exclusive to us or if it's all not in guitar players but people who liked the instrumental guitar driven album um if everybody kind of develops tastes that expand further beyond that but you know i will say for for that style of album it does kind of perfectly encapsulate like a snapshot of that moment in at least in my life right like that's it's a, a microcosm of everything else that was going on and even though I'm not sitting down and listening to, you know, new albums coming out that are strictly instrumental for 10 hours a week. It, it, it is cool. It's nostalgic to a certain degree. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think on the whole, I liked this album. Like you said, it not not my absolute favorite thing that, that Vi's ever done, but I, I did like this album a lot um, for, for a few different reasons, which I guess we'll get into. But um, yeah... Above anything else, I think you can say that this album is nothing if not a Steve Vai record, which I know kind yeah, of... absolutely. It, it probably sounds cheeky, but I do think that's something that, at least from my perspective, it seems like lacks a lot nowadays, is that you have artists or bands, and ho however they get there is is valid, right? I'm not here to say, oh, an album should or be shouldn't. Uh, should or shouldn't be recorded in a certain way, but it, at least for me, I definitely have a a lot of admiration and respect for you know these kind of uh, what do they call it? auteur type of oh yeah uh, definitely musicians to where they don't give a shit about what anybody says. They're going to make an album the way they want, and sometimes it connects with me, and they stick the landing, and I really like it, and sometimes it doesn't. But just being able to say that. You made that type of album. You don't really care about, uh, uh, you know, other people's opinions on it, and you're going to make a statement. I think is is ballsy, and I, I can really appreciate that, especially the older I get. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that was the one of the biggest things in, in listening through this record. You know, several times, kind of taking notes on it. I actually wrote in my notes um, in several spots as the songs progressed, viisms. 
lots of viisms, lots of viisms. And I think that's great because I mean that's you know the the artist personality. I think I know us as musicians like a big a big focus and something that I think we put a lot of effort into is really developing our own voice and our own personality on the instrument, you know, or, or sense of self on the instrument. And that's one of the things too, if you've read any of, you know, Vi's uh, interviews or a lot of the writing he's done in educational sense or, you know, seminars he's done, those types of things, online classes, that's one of the big things it seems like he pushes is, hey, this is how I do it, but drop all that do it your own way. There's mm-hmm. no rules. There's no right or wrong. It's really developing your voice on the instrument because that's what music is. So I've always really kind of, that's come from a place, uh, kind of a deep place whenever I hear Vi say that. And mm-hmm. that always really resonated with me in terms of what are we playing music for? Uh, are we playing music just to play it? We're certainly not playing this type of music for the chicks, right? So like, what are we, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind yeah. of the thing. It's like you, you, you have to really strive to develop that voice so and i think this record encapsulates that as you said it's a vi record through and through definitely and i do think that not to to get too far off topic but i think if you're going to make it as a musician if you're going to make it as a musician in general like forget if you are a guitar virtuoso like steve Vai and that's the type of creative outlet that you pursue but just to make it as a musician in general like that's the one component you have to make if you are selling yourself or your brand. Like it's, you know, you can get a gig as uh, a, a sideman for, you know, whoever touring, if you've got the chops and everything. But what really, I think, differentiates that top caliber of musician from a, a sellability standpoint and an identity stamp, uh, standpoint is really having that voice, that distinct vision and I do think, you know, Steve Vai kind of embodies it, and a lot of those older albums kind of do. And, you know, it's it's easy and I think kind of cheap of people to say, like, oh, you know, pop records nowadays, they all sound the same. Like, no, they don't at all. And, you know, the the singers and, and songwriters that are out there that are really, you know, top caliber and that people gravitate towards, they have their own style that they know they've mastered and that's that's who they are and you know that is really paramount to their success you know and you can say yeah but they're not writing their own songs but like look if you if you were to write a song for Beyonce and give it to her to perform her performance and her execution and conviction as an artist are what's going to sell that mm-hmm. if, if the Absolutely, song is yeah. great but like if the song is great then then awesome but the fact is once you give it to an artist like that it's not like they are devoid of input but like they their execution of it is what you're trying to get and it's still very much their voice and their style that is kind of cutting through yeah definitely i mean they're different parts of, of a whole you know yeah so i think that that's that's great too. Like someone uh, with Vi's background and certainly with his musical knowledge, which I envy. You know, I, I'm very much not a player cut from the same cloth as Vi. You know, uh, we always kind of joke around about it, right? I'm yeah. the like seat of my pants, write a riff, it's cool, or write a melody and it's cool, and just kind of Gripping have at it, ha- have at it because it, you know I've, I've distilled, captured that lightning in a bottle. But I think for Vi to be able to do that, but then also have that um, musical knowledge and that that really uh, deep deep understanding of kind of what the the options are Mm -hmm. being able to approach it from all those angles really i think gives him a degree of versatility that a lot of artists don't have especially in that instrumental guitar rock sphere Mm -hmm. he can really go places and certainly does especially on this record go places that most of us would just kind of dream to go you know you you wouldn't be able to get there at least not the same way so so he does so effortlessly you bring up an interesting point, you know, Steve I's identity as a, not just a performing musician, but a songwriter, right? You think of Steve Vai, what do you think of? Obviously, good guitar playing, but like that, that's so general, like, you know, specifically, I know what I gravitate towards um, are a few, a few things that I think he does better than just about anybody else. And I, I guess better isn't the right word, but he's more deliberate about than most rock metal instrumental guitarists. And I think the first thing for me is phrasing. Like, you know, it's, it's evidence in 
so I, actually, I guess let me take a step back. So this album is the things that work for me and what make it a Vi record for me um, are him taking those distinct little anachronisms. I don't even know if that's the right word to use, but, you know, those little eccentricities and dialing them up. And I feel like that happened a lot on this album. You think of phrasing, right? And it's been presence. He did a whole video, I think, on Freak Show Excess back in the day, shortly after that album came out, and talks about just the main riff and all the little nuances that it takes to make that album sound like you're not just reading, or make that song sound like you're not just reading it off of a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. You think of that, you think of, um, and I guess it would still technically fall under, under phrasing, but you think a lot of the really out there sounds really that he's making the guitar do that aren't necessarily melodic but still fall within key to an extent and still serve the song you know what i mean and another one which i'll get into but like what do you what do you think of typically when you think of vi like what are those hallmarks you're looking for yeah you know i mean i would say the main thing for me would be just a sense of musical just adventure mm. that that's always what has kind of separated Vi for me from a lot of the other instrumental guitar heroes uh especially in my formative years because i i have to be honest for as much as i have come to really appreciate Vi's back catalog kind of the, the breadth of the back catalog mm. i remember early on as a young you know burgeoning shredder being disappointed a lot of the times listening to Vi because i was looking for the, you know, Ingve shred licks. And, and that's really kind of what I gravitated towards because at the time I was getting my chops in order. So it was very important to me to kind of hear those runs and, to, to you know, to develop my own sense of uh, musical phrasing and, you know, try to glean as much as I could from those performances. So I was listening to a lot of that, um, you know, the shrapnel stuff mm -hmm. and really just everything that I could take in. Whereas a lot of what Vi was doing was kind of over my head at the time. I, I couldn't really appreciate that sense of musical adventure quite as much as I can now. Sure. Um, so I remember like listening back to like Passion and Warfare and listening to the record. And there's a lot of really great songs on that record and a lot of really great playing. But like, I remember being most excited by like, you know, uh, uh, part in like For the Love of God where he does the run. Yeah, you know the that was like yeah. Well, why isn't there more of that, Steve? When really, if you you take that whole record holistically, like it's an incredible record from beginning to end. Masterpiece, just, yeah, yeah. And it, that was really something I couldn't appreciate as a musician, as a guitar player, until later, until I had some more musical understanding under my belt. So yeah, no, it's interesting you bring that up because I think it was literally a couple of weeks ago. Like I know personally, one of the things I've been trying to work on a lot is my vocabulary and taking and borrowing different riffs and i think you know pound for pound steve eyes probably my favorite guitar player you know from the time i was growing up through now and so i sat down and i thought to myself like okay you know what i'm gonna listen to some steve eyes solos and see if i can pick some runs out of there that i like and there definitely are runs but <laughs> i was kind of surprised listening back to it like man there's a lot of stuff in there that only Steve Vai could pull off, and it's not yeah, absolutely, and it's not because he's playing at a, a thousand notes per second, but he has such an intimate understanding of the instrument and what he's trying to get across in that song to where he's going to think of something that is more than you know, sixteenth uh, note triplets mm -hmm. on, on the high absolutely. E string. I mean, it's it's so out there, and I I definitely think that's what makes him unique in my book. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think in terms of what I look for now out of a buy record, I mean, it's really looking for that. You know, yeah. I'm not looking for just some other kind of bargain basement shredder person. Nor, nor do I do that really with any music I listen to nowadays. Because as you know, the spread of the internet is kind of uh, gone unimpeded. I guess you could say, for better or worse, uh, in the 21st century here, there's so much access now to guitar instruction and you can look at someone else's youtube channel for a breakdown of how they play this song and mm -hmm. people can play sweep arpeggios at 300 beats per minute nowadays and like it's great i think that the technicality and the physicality of being able to do that type of thing is phenomenal but you know to be the old man get off my lawn i definitely appreciate now or, or have developed that appreciation for phrasing and for that musical vocabulary and mm -hmm. 
um, you know, approaching things in a different way. Just because you can play it fast and you can shred it doesn't necessarily mean you always have to. It's nice to be able to, which is another thing I respect Vi for, have have those tools in your toolkit and to be able to dial it up to 200 miles an hour when you need to. Oh, yeah. But to then know, I think that's the wisdom of it, right? That's the wisdom of him having a 40-plus year career and now of me playing guitar for 20 years myself, like going on 20 years myself. You can do it, but it's knowing when not to do it. Yeah. And that's really what I think, you know, he, he's becoming that sage. Not that he always wasn't, but he, I think he's developing into that. Uh, as, as his hair is going gray now, um, he's kind of developing into that role. So. And I, I guess to kind of put the feather in that cap, um, the other thing that I noticed that was really dialed up outside of the the phrasing and kind of the out there stuff, which we'll get into a little bit more when we talk about the tracks individually, is a really, really dense, um, evolved, that was funny, a really dense, evolved sense of harmony on this album. And there's, he's done it in bits and pieces in past records. Like, he's never been a guy where it's like, okay, G chord, D chord, A chord, like, grip it and rip it on a minor pentatonic. Like, he's always, there's always been stuff there that's been interesting to listen to and is kind of intriguing to the ear, but... Prior to this record, I think the moment I always uh, thought of to encapsulate that idea was, um, it wasn't Tender Surrender, it was Die to Live on Alien Love Secrets. And, you know, nice straight-ahead melody. There's a little bit of of some deceptive, um, not deceptive cadence in the true sense of the word, but lots of, you know, some little twists and turns in the court in the, the main part of the song. But during the bridge and the guitar solo, like, it's so easy to miss because it's in the background but the not only the type of chords that he has in the background being kind of out there compared to what the key center is but the voicings and the tensions on the chord you know you go back and listen to it it's like whoa there's there's a whole lot there Mm -hmm. and the fact that he can make it work within the context of a more or less straight ahead kind of song I think is really impressive. It's like it's like Rush, right? Mm. A lot of people like Rush because they're they aren't playing off the fact, or weren't playing off the fact, that what they're doing is really complicated. What they're doing sounds easy, and it's when you try to play yeah, it that absolutely. It's, and I thought there was a lot of moments on the album like that for me, um, that were had those moments of really dense, really interesting voicings for chords, but. You know, dialed up to 11 and it was in a lot of songs and I don't know if that was as a result of him writing the album in I don't know if he wrote it in quarantine you know there's there's stuff out there but there's surprisingly little information about this album out there as as we've both found trying to research it so yeah um, yeah yeah I guess this is as good of a point as any really uh, to start talking about individual songs if you want yeah sure um well, so yeah, I guess kind of as a, a good segue into that, um, you know, one of the, the, the broad kind of strokes, I guess I would say, for for my initial listening of the record, and we'll break this down a little bit more as we go track by track, but the production on this record is kind of all over the place. And I don't mean that necessarily as a negative, but what I mean is, you know, it, it very much varies song to song. Whereas an album, even like go back to like uh, Real Illusions, Reflections, mm-hmm. like it was a very diverse record to me. Truthfully, that's for as much as I love Passion Warfare as a classic. That's my favorite Vi record. That sure. was the one that blew my mind as a young guitar player, young kind of Same. blossoming musician. That was just like whoa, you Same. know. Um, and that was right around the time too. I bought Live at Astoria and all the the classics that every yeah. every guitar player has in their arsenal, right, or in their DVD collection. But uh, yeah, for me, like, there's definitely songs on this record where things are stripped back almost as far as I've ever heard Vi play. Mm-hmm. But then there's other songs where it's a lot more kind of dense modern production. Some songs where things are further back uh, in the mix. There's some <clears> things <throat> where things are a little bit more straightforward. So it really does vary song to song, which also kind of leads to, I guess, an observation that I had just globally about the record, I guess you could say, or, or as a whole piece it has a very kind of 
it has, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to say it, kind of a, uh, a looseness or like a jammy sort of vibe to it as opposed to a lot of previous Vi material where it seems like it's very stringently and kind of strictly <clears throat> composed. Not to say mm -hmm. it doesn't have feel, a lot of the old material doesn't have feel because that's not the case at all, just the opposite, but a lot of the tracks as they kind of went by, it, it retained that sort of like jammy, like, and I say this in the best way possible, um, like... Vi wrote the arrangement, he wrote the, the chord progression, and then he just played over it. Sure. As opposed to composing every note. Yeah. Um, and in some instances, I felt like that worked, and in some instances, didn't quite as work for me. Um, but that being said, one of my highlights of the record was uh, Teeth of the Hydra. Okay. I really, really, you know, it was obviously the opening track, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I know, you know, we can, we can talk at length about the, uh, the guitar that kind of sparked, uh, that idea. I'm sure it's the guitar that's on the cover of the record that, that Vi has the monstrosity, but yeah. <laughs> the song itself, it was really interesting to me because, and it's funny too, that it's called Teeth of the Hydra because immediately I was halfway through the song and it just hit me Toto, Toto. Hmm. And the reason I say that is I'm a big fan of uh, the Toto record 14, which is the most recent one they did. And there's a lot of, of elements of that really big kind of 80s production and electronic elements, synth hits and that type of thing, which I'm sure is, is kind of reflected in Vi trying to use this guitar. It's got all this you know, fretless bass and you know uh, sympathetic <clears throat> strings and all this stuff. But I really enjoyed just the production of that song. It's weird because it it's kind of has this this cold sort of like I said it's it's big and it's kind of far back, but it really works and it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I really like that main motif and theme that he kind of develops over the course of that song as well. Yeah, no, I see you have written here strong main theme. This one works well, highlight of the album. And I will say that you know, experimental, yes. Good production, yes, objectively, which I think I think is something that gets overlooked a lot is how much work Steve Vai puts into the actual engineering and mixing of these albums. Like he's got his fingers and everything from front to back, and unlike a lot of musicians who kind of reach that point, like he's good at all of it mm -hmm. too. And oh yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think that's that's one of the underrated things. But uh, not to get too far off track here. So Teeth of the Hydra. This one I didn't care for, really, from front to back. I can't say why. It just didn't, for whatever reason, didn't have that spark with me. Yeah. Again, great playing, great production. But for me, it's one of those songs where it's cool to listen to once or twice, and I don't necessarily feel like a strong urge to, to go back on it. Yeah, I will say, talking about you know the, uh, the legend of Steve I, <laughs> like... How much balls does it take to call up Hoshino and be like, guys, listen, I'm kind of getting bored with guitar. Can you make something that is so challenging <laughs> yeah. for me to play that I have to yeah. reevaluate how I... Weighs 50 pounds and yeah, costs $30,000. Has an electronic stimulation unit on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's that's the thing that's funny, too. Like you said, only he could call up Ibanez and say, hey, you know... Uh, make this thing for me and and then go through all the iterations of it and everything else like that it's it kind of comes back as well to like i always think back to the the 90s dvds and like live at astoria like mm -hmm. vi has always had that visual component as well to his music he's a consummate showman absolutely his shows were always you know a blast and there was always some sort of visual component so i think that the Hydra guitar is just the next extension of that. And it was cool to me to see him, uh, or hear him, I guess you'd say, use that instrument, mm -hmm. as he says he did. I, I haven't seen any videos of him recording anything with it yet, but, you know, they may exist. But to, to you know, take that and then take it as a challenge to, okay, now I've done this thing, I have to write a piece of music with this. Um, I think it was cool. And, you know, it, it's funny, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on the rest of the record, because... I had the exact opposite reaction to Teeth of the Hydra. That is the one of the the few things in my mind after you know four or five listens through the record that really sticks in my yeah. in my inner ear. You know that's that main theme kind of keeps coming back just because I I really something resonated with me with just how big it is the, the hits yeah okay Dun -dun -dun -dun, you know that, that just really resonated with me. I sure. just really really uh, like that what he did with that and I kind of 
appreciate the experimentalism there. Sure. Um, it plays off some of the modern kind of, dare I say, genty tropes, but it does it in a way, to me, that sounds fresh. It doesn't sound like he's trying to chase the yeah that scene, necessarily. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. And again, that's... It, I don't really care for it, but it's by no means a bad song. You know what I mean? Just for whatever reason... Yeah, it just didn't grab you. Yeah. Uh, second track, Zeus and Chains. I have your notes here. They say, jammy vibe, lead work is solid, highlight of song. Yeah. So, uh, basically, I thought the the uh, the solo in this song was really, really strong. Mm-hmm. I think this was one of the songs that he, if I'm not mistaken, I think he releases as a single as well. Um, he he may, It's hard to keep track of because it was such a staggered release. Yeah, he had like three or four singles off yeah. of this one, I think. But, yeah, you know, I, I definitely, th- this is, to me... Not so much Teeth of the Hydra, but this is really where uh, I started marking down in my notes like the jammy vibe. Mm-hmm. Because this, to me, it, at least with a lot of the lead parts, it, it does. It, it seemed very kind of freeform and flowing, mm-hmm. at least for Vi. Now, again, too, if you really go back and think about it, um, I admittedly was not a big fan of Story of Light. Mm-hmm. I gave it a few listens to. Didn't really revisit it, um, you know, and obviously a lot of the other material that he's put out since, in one way, shape, or form, is a kind of reworking of older material. So, to me, the last really, um, I guess, strong Vi release that resonated with me as a listener is Real Illusions Reflections, which is one of my favorite records of Same. all time. So now it's comparing Inviolate with that, and it's, to me, if I look at the way the songs are constructed mm-hmm. from my uh, layman's understanding of that, you know, being a songwriter myself, but not really diving all that deep into that, you know, what, which you would dive into or think or an- analyze it. I think to me, um, it just does. It has a certain looseness to it. Not that it's, it's bad. It's just different. It's a different approach. Well, no, I think it serves the song most importantly. Yeah. I feel like, you know, teeth of the Hydra, you know, being uh, a statement nonetheless to start the album Zeus and Chains was for me I think the beginning of a really a run of several songs on here where it felt like a classic Steve I record you know what I mean mm-hmm. from the playing the phrasing you know you could put Zeus and Chains next to and I know I'm going back to Alien Love Secrets but you could put this album swap it out for the second track on that album in place of Juice, and it probably had the same type of vibe. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. Um, the third track, Little Pretty, really interesting, again, interesting concept. You know, what? how can I take this this style that I've developed and how can I keep pushing it and, you know, uh, try to force my technique and my writing to, to, to change and, you know, not be stagnant with songwriting and... Uh, you can look this up on YouTube. There's a great video with some world class knee bending in it. But he does this whole song on a hollow body guitar. Looks like an Ibanez art core. Um, and it's interesting to me because a lot of the phrasing things where I would always assume it would be something with a Floyd Rose on it in terms of ascending or descending into notes. And maybe it's because he has such thin gauge strings on all of his guitars. At least I, I think he's using like nines or lighter for most things. I could be wrong on that. Uh, somebody will correct me online. Uh, but the same thing, the phrasing, it still sounds like Steve I playing a gem, even though it's on an art core. But I, I will say the overall vibe of the tune is is something different. It sounds like Steve Vai getting to this destination by, by taking the back rows. And it's not like, you know, you'd assume if he changes the type of guitar he's playing, he'd be going to a different destination. But it's interesting because I'm, I'm wondering if it was him playing the hollow body guitar and just writing as normal and changing his writing style to uh, to compensate for that. And I guess compensate isn't the right word because he totally owns the playing on that song. But for me, uh, I think that was one of my one of my favorite tunes on the, the record. I was kind of uh, enamored with the video when it came out. It was a really interesting premise. Uh, in general, I, I like it a lot. I see here you have heavy motif and bass line used effectively. Yeah, so I really like that. Uh, I'm going to sound like an idiot here, but the dun, 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 dun you know, brr, brr, that rhythmic yeah. motif that keeps coming up I thought was just so cool um, because 
every time it, it comes in, you know, that there's that kind of sustaining chord that's over the top of it. So it's he's not necessarily drawing your attention to it in a way where uh, most, you know, heavy artists of our mm-hmm. ilk would do it. It's not the, you know, oh, yeah, here's this this really heavy, genty part or whatever. But it, it injects enough personality into that part of the song every time it comes up to where it kind of brings everything back down to the center, if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's a really, to me, a really strong motif uh, given the direction he was heading on this record i think it's, it's cool to see those elements and we'll talk about it as it comes up mm-hmm. but those elements of his past those elements of kind of the metal side sure. they came through but much less beat you over the head this time well which I, I i appreciated absolutely and i think this is just as good of a place as any to talk about some of the technical details on the album because it's really interesting and i don't know if it's you know what it was intentionally kind of made this vague but obviously most of this was recorded at his studio in California, the Harmony Huts, which if you haven't had the chance yet, check out some videos because it's awesome, uh, especially for guitar players. There's a lot of history in that room, and engineers can find something cool to latch on to. Like that whole desk has custom like preamps and EQs and everything in there. There's been a lot of money, a lot of money, but a lot of consideration poured into it. Um, assistant engineer, Nico, and I'm going to mess this up, Ing- Inghilterra. But this is where it gets interesting for me. So it says, Assistant Engineer Nico drums for Little Pretty, Zeus and Chains, and Greenish Blues um, recorded at, and I'm not sure if it was something off in the formatting on the site. It says Studio 606, but does that mean that Nico was the one who played drums, or was it... I mean, I I would have to assume Jeremy Coulson's like on standby for anything that yeah, that's yeah. Steve I, but th- it isn't made entirely clear, but... Nevertheless, it seems like those drums were recorded at Studio 606 in Northridge, uh, engineered there by John Lusto. Um, again, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, assistant engineer Evan Mayakovsky. Mayaskovsky. Um, but mix for the album was by Steve Vai at the Harmony Huts, uh, except for Knapsack, which we'll get to, which is also mixed by Greg Worth, who engineered the album with Steve Vai. So the overall, um, well, and I, I'm sorry, there's some other stuff here. Greenish Blues and Candle Power mixed by Mike Frazier at Armory Studios, Armory Studios, Vancouver, British Columbia. Mike Frazier's assistant, Ricardo Germain, mastered by Bernie Grundman himself. So there's a lot of kind of ambiguity there in terms of, is it all Vai doing everything, programming the drums? Because at least for the section that I think you're talking about with the, the really heavy kind of droning thing, mm-hmm. that to me kind of screams program drums. You know what I yeah. mean? I don't know if you got the same vibe. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did. And and that was that, that's another thing that's interesting about the production of this record. Uh, it definitely, to me... So uh, the, the, the vibe I got generally, the, the, the vibe check I got, uh, as you would say, is, after listening to this record... It, it really strikes me as a quarantine record. I, yeah. I personally think, and it's just my theory, that Steve had other plans, whether those were live plans, and I think it's been documented he had plans for other records. I think he said he was working on an acoustic record and he was working on finally finishing you know, the, the, the part three of the trilogy. Um, I think he wrote a couple songs, had fun, thought they were cool, and just went after it. Mm-hmm. And and did this record kind of in the new school way. Yeah, I think there was a lot of collaboration and a lot of calling up folks and saying, "Hey, can you know we're gonna do this drum, you know, this drum part, or can we do this or whatever?" And there was a lot of that um, to, yeah. to kind of get the the end result. Now, again, h- kind of hard to verify. At least the sources I was looking at, um, kind of hard to pull together exactly who played on the record and what they played and where they played it. And it, absolutely, you know, and there, there's like. It's interesting because there's a great bass solo. I think it's on, it's either on Zeus and Chains or Candle Power. I can't remember which one, or it could be. On I might have written that down because I know that uh, there was a, a bass solo that was really striking that I, I highlighted as a. And it's like, okay, is that Vi playing it? Because that sounds, and I know you'll know what I mean when I say this. That sounds like a bass player playing that solo. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. The way it was approached uh, and everything was, you know, screamed. Uh, a bass player, bass player mm. doing it. And if that's the case, I mean, mad props to Steve Vai for having not only a uh, a singular voice on guitar, but also being able to adapt that to 
play bass like a, a bass player, not a guitar player playing bass. Yeah. Now I will say too, one thing we should we should probably highlight for the listeners. So, like the majority of you know mo- modern music consumption, right? Uh, I listen to the record on streaming services, mm-hmm. and I'm probably gonna say you did as well. So I know that there's physical copy that you could get, and I'm sure the physical copy may have much more information in that regard. Yeah. But we weren't able to locate at least that information. So. Yeah, if, if anybody knows, feel yeah, free to leave everyone it in, owns in the, the CD. Please below. let us know because yeah. I'm really curious because there we, is some really great playing on the record. Yeah, uh, in those kind of uh, you know secondary role, secondary to, to vibe. But to, to your point too, from uh, a few minutes ago, I think there there are definitely moments where it it blurs the line between a lot of that um, electronic production and programmed instrumentation versus real to where sometimes it even blurs the line in some of these songs what, what's programmed what what's not maybe there's there's programmed parts and uh recorded instruments yeah. going on at the same time just to really kind of highlight whatever uh steve is going after in terms of either the mood or the part or whatever so it's kind of cool to me when you see an artist um that can kind of get past that notion of it has to be this or it has to be, you know, to just really say it's what, what serves the song and, and really to have an album full of songs like that where the production does vary uh, from song to song in service of the song, I think is, is great, you know. Absolutely. Just a fearlessness, I think, especially in our current kind of musical climate to just go after it. Candle Power. I loved this song. I thought it was a great fourth track on a Steve Vai record, which um, I'm sure you probably know about it in case uh, the listeners don't know about this. Um, Steve Vai typically has, and I don't know all the context behind it, um, but he has, at least in records in the past, have, you know, he has like a pre-established type of order for what vibe he wants on what uh, song slots on the album. Like, he had a uh, a, a compilation or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Starts with an A. Oh my God, anthology. Oh, anthology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had he had an anthology that he released back in early two thousands, I think, called the Seventh Song. And he, I remember looking at this one day after middle school when I got home on my gateway computer that the Seventh Song for him had some metaphysical. Uh, yeah, like meaning mystical. to it with with the number seven, and that's mm-hmm. why a lot of the ballads are always placed on the seventh slot. And I I don't know what the the rationale is, but I've noticed that the fourth track always has that kind of funky, slappy single coil type of feel to it. Uh, and I think out of all those, again going back to Alien Love Secrets, to me this was probably the best one of those songs since The Boy from Seattle, at, at least for me. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about it? So I think there is, if I remember correctly, in in this tune, there were a lot of really cool kind of like rhythmic, there was a lot of cool rhythmic interplay between what Vi is doing and also what the drums and the bass are doing. Um, So I enjoyed that aspect of it. To me, and this is one of those instances too where it's like, okay, who's playing on it? I thought there was like almost a, um, like a, what came to my mind and I wrote down was like snarky puppy esque, mm-hmm. like really like tight drums where the drums are stripped down, but everything's locking in really well. Uh, I really like the intro a lot. Oh yeah. I will be honest though. And it's kind of funny, you know, again, two, two different Vi fans coming from two different kind of schools here. I, I probably like this song the least of all the songs thus far. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was just one of those where I, th- I thought it started really strong, but the song started to kind of lose me as it went on. I really enjoyed that section where, like I said, there's that really tight rhythmic interplay between the drums, especially like the snare and a lot of that really tight cymbal work um, that's so prevalent on like, uh, you know, uh, what, like, like I said, snarky, pumpy, uh, snarky, pumpy. <laughs> I'm snarky, getting all these visuals now coming into my head. <laughs> Snarky Puppy and like Wolfpack and a lot of those bands where they're really stripped down. It's not necessarily my style typically. But I really, I like that um, sense where they can bring, the, the, the group can bring the dynamic way down, mm-hmm. and then they can bring it way up. Yeah. And I did appreciate that on this song. I well, thought he did that. And I, you know, same type of thing, like, the the drums on this, if they are programmed drums, which I don't know, actually, I don't think this one was. This was, drums for Little Pretty, Zeus and Chains, 
and greenish blue. So yeah, this this isn't one of the ones listed in the liner notes, at least from what was available on Steve's website. It sounds like someone playing it. It though. It, it does it definitely like, does. Like it has a, that vibe. A lot of the the little flourishes and everything seems like something that a drummer, and especially a drummer who's worked with Steve Vai in the past, would have put in. You know. So, Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, no, it's. Uh, it's it's got a lot of interesting little phrases and twists and turns in it in general. Lots of nuances. It's yeah. a very dense song. Not again, too, kind of like what we got through in the intro. It, surface level, you know, you can listen to it, you can kind of follow it, but there's a lot rhythmically going on. There's a lot of weird subdivisions he's mm-hmm. doing and syncopation and just you know, you're not necessarily going to pick that up on the first listen. Yeah. But you know, when you listen to it a little bit deeper, it's like whoa. Okay, Steve. Oh yeah. I think in, and that was really one of your points with uh, you know his chord progressions or the the chord voicings that he chooses. Mm-hmm. I think rhythmically it was the same for that song. Absolutely. Which I feel like you know the few songs we've discussed up to this point, leading into this next one, um, Apollo in color. I on the first listen through on this album, I I don't think I cared for it too much. And listening to it a second and third time. It's actually really grown on me quite a bit, and like you said, it's. I think it's an embracing of the little bit looser structure uh, for the song uh, that works really well. I think it works in this song's favor. It's got great playing. I I don't know what it is about it that has grown on me, but you know, listening to it in context, and I do. I feel like this is one of the benefits to still releasing albums as opposed to just singles. Mm-hmm. Where it sits in the album serves this, at least in my opinion, I feel like that serves the song and kind of elevating it. Not that it's a bad song at all, but having it surrounded by Avalanche and Candle Power, to me, is definitely, it's considerate for the the listener who's going to listen to this album front to back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, oh, and this was the one that has the bass solo in it. Strong bass solo, nice groove. So. Yeah, absolutely. So same thing too, like we kind of hit on it before, so I mean we don't have to really beat it to death now, but yeah, just it, it kind of comes out of nowhere and it's such a cool part and it's mm-hmm. just really, I, I always, I try to come up with a better descriptor for something than tasty, but that was, the, 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 first, the first thought was that's a tasty bass solo. It is tasty stuff. Absolutely. Um, Avalanche. You have riffy, cool intro, proggy riffing, uh, more aggressive in metal than anything thus far, effective in melodic main theme, nice melodic movement, um, solo at 2.45 uh, is a high, or the solo and breakdown at 2 minutes 45 seconds are a highlight of the album for you. Yeah, I love this song. I thought it was great. And, and I think, too... What I would say kind of harkens back to what you just said, it, it, where this song slots into the record as an experience. Because if you had an album full of these songs, this song wouldn't be as effective as it is. Yeah, It's the fact that everything that came before was really, you know, a lot more melodic. I think there are certainly elements like uh, we, we had uh, touched on before where it was a lot more stripped down. To then go into a song that has, you know, really a, the main riff is a metal riff. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, there's some odd times going on. There's that metal riff. Um, there's like that really cool, um, you know, I don't know intervalically exactly what he's doing there, but there's that really cool kind of like interval based main theme that he does that just really is memorable and, mm-hmm. and, and, and kind of sings in, in the absence of a vocalist. So I really, really enjoyed that. And the solo for me was just so strong. It just and really encapsulated that, and another song which we'll get to just really to me encapsulates Vi. Yeah, it, it really touched on everything he's so good at, and then added that little bit of kind of that that shreddy flair to almost uh, kind of reminds me of um, obviously a much different song, but like in uh, Freak Show Excess where you know he kind of almost like it shows he still still got it. Not that anyone right. questioned that he he didn't still have it, but you know he. He definitely brings it with that solo, and that's to me kind of like the little wink, like yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. still have those chops. Yeah, no, no I mean, lest anyone worry about that. I mean, dude plays his ass off on every single recording he's ever been on. You can never, you can never really question his integrity or, or his effort on anything. Like, I don't think there's anything that you could say Steve Eyes ever phoned it in on. There's certainly songs and in some cases albums out there that you know might not strike your fancy but i don't think you can ever question that 
any of those albums were made with anything less than his full attention and, and yeah commitment, commitment. absolutely yeah. yep um greenish blues seventh song or yeah greenish blues so, seventh song on the album old school sounding song you have very stripped down for vi main solo a master class of vi elements and i would agree with that i do think it's a great vi solo this is one of the few songs for me on the album where I feel like the solo is great. The overall uh, substance of the tune didn't really connect with me a whole lot. But if I'm speaking honestly here, then maybe just my taste. I'll say out of all the seventh songs that Steve Eyes put out, the two that always stick with me are um, obviously For the Love of God. I feel like that's most people's... Yeah, all, all time. Yeah. All timer. <laughs> but also Lotus Fleet, I feel like. Or, I'm sorry, there's three. For the love of God, Lotus Fleet, and Whispering a Prayer. Yeah. Are are really what, sh- uh, what do it for me. And all for different reasons. For the love of God, you know, same type of thing. It's kind of a, uh, a feature for a guitar player that is trying to state something emotionally... Outside of Look How Fast I Can Play, which I know that's never really his M.O. anyways, but, you know, he definitely tries to make some type of emotional impact. And I feel like for out of all three of those, for me, Whispering a Prayer kind of toes that line the best where it's a very strong melodic statement. It's executed in an interesting way uh, with the sustainer and everything. But anyways, this is now a review for uh, Live at the Astoria, by the way. <laughs> Um, Which is great, and you should buy it, but you probably already have it. Yeah. Especially if you're watching this review. But, yeah, no, I I didn't hate the song. It wasn't my thing, but I will say it had a great solo in it. Yeah, and I guess I would agree with you there. So I think, you know, substantively, yeah, you know, not not the best. Um, Again, I'm not saying I could do any better, but I think the solo for me really stood out. Like, for, for what comes before being just kind of, you know what is my interpretation of Vi's version of like a blues, right. Or, or, Mm -hmm. uh, an emotive sort of form. Cause I think that's what he was going after. Cool. Okay, fine. I can buy that. But the solo is just such a a knockout, you know, it's just, wow. So, so that, that's what really kind of struck me about that tune. Absolutely. So let's talk about the gorilla in the room knapsack. What did you think the first time you saw that video? I mean, I, I am, <laughs> I, <laughs> it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I, I always, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's kind of the same thing with like teeth of the Hydra, right. But in a different way, it's like, I, I hesitate to use the word gimmick, right. Cause to me, it's like, okay, it, it's, especially with the limitation that he had when he wrote that song and recorded that song it's cool to find different ways to solve problems, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that the, the video itself was really entertaining. Um, this is one of those songs, though, honestly, I don't really care for. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's up there with uh, Candle Power, with one of my favorite songs on yeah. the album. And I know, like, after reading online, I guess the, the Hydra project came first. He said it's been several years in the making with that. Um, before we get too far down the line, if you have no idea what we're talking about right now, type in Knapsack on YouTube and watch the video of Steve I. The, the long and the short of it is, I think it was wrist surgery or something, right, that he had performed. Yeah. And he's got a brace on both wrists, and his right arm is in a sling, and he does the yeah. entire song with one hand, but it's not like, you know, okay, um, Angus Young playing Thunderstruck with one hand, like, phrasing... Uh, dynamics, everything that you would expect to be done with two hands is there. It's yeah. not. It sounds like he's not even hobbled really. Yeah, <laughs> at yeah, all. He, you know, he's proving that he has more talent in four fingers than musicians yeah, have in yeah, their whole bodies. Absolutely. But I, I will say, even though, even knowing that Hydra had started before that, I wonder, you know, where this fell chronologically in the order of writing the songs on the album, and if maybe. Something like this had inspired a uh, little pretty, like, hmm, okay, I forced myself to adapt to uh, whatever limitations I have at the time or adapt to what I'm presented with. 
and still knock it out of the park, still write, in my opinion, you know, one of the best tunes on the album that has a lot of attention, same thing, a lot of attention paid to, de- to detail here, I think. Um, and, okay, maybe that sparked something where, you know what, that was cool, I'm going to try it on, or I'm going to try writing a song on Hollow Body. I've never done that on an album before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. I, I, I wonder, because it seems like there's a lot of firsts on this album in terms of taking some of those creative risks. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just wondering if there was a, a moment that started that or if it was, if maybe that's something he does on all of his albums that, you know, we've just overlooked up to this point. Yeah, no, I could totally see that. I wouldn't be surprised if this was one of the uh, the catalysts for this record. Sure. I wouldn't be surprised if this was one of the first songs that he wrote for this record because it, it feels like... For, for for as much as you know it's not it's not that I dislike the song per se it's just not one of my favorites mm-hmm. I think um, in, I might even say it in my notes like lots of viisms but in this song that takes on a little bit more of a negative connotation for me in terms of mm-hmm. my interpretation of vi and it's not necessarily the the phrasing uh, you know choices that he makes or the musical choices or whatever it it really comes down to a lot of the the wah you know, Sure. There's a part towards the the middle, I'd say middle to end of the song, where he's he's kind of doing the wanky thing. <laughs> and for me, that was a big point of contention that I had with Vi a lot in those early days, especially where you know I was laser focused on picking, and you know I was more the Paul Gilbert, John Petrucci school of you know uh, the the three note per string and and that type of thing. And I couldn't really appreciate a lot of the phrasing that he did when it, he mm-hmm. would kind of do that type of solo. And there's a lot of soloing and a lot of melodic statements he makes on this record, I think, where he kind of avoids that. But Knapsack, to me, was one of those instances where he kind of leaned into that. Sure. And it just, it, it was <clears throat> weird, but when I was listening to the song, my brain just kind of went on autopilot okay. a little bit at that part. Um, but, uh, you know, I appreciate what he's doing, and, and knowing the context of the song and knowing that he's doing all that with one hand, it's, it's obviously impressive. Uh, but that was just kind of to me where I was like, yeah, you know, okay. Mm-hmm. That I think I wrote down. That's where Vi loses me a little bit. It, sure. Or in parts like that. Not that I can't appreciate it, but just not my favorite Vi. I sure. Guess you could say. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, finally, closer on the album, Sandman Cloud Mist. Um, I thought this was a weird way to end the album. Truthfully, I I agree. It's not what I would typically consider a closer from a vice standpoint like the i think to me if i have to think of how does steve Vai close an album the one i always go back to is uh under it all mm-hmm. and you know that's a longer song there's more detail i mean granted it was on a i think i think you can call real illusions a concept album yeah um, i do i kind of consider it a you know it's not told through yeah it's it's not a um linear story Mm -hmm. and i think it even says that in the booklet that was always like a joke that i laughed about whenever i read through the booklet um you know i I think he even has a note in there it's like this is not told in any particular order or whatever yeah but i i definitely think there's there's a thread that kind of links that album and i guess you could say to an extent like this to me really strikes me as more a collection of songs Mm -hmm. it's i think it's a strong album in its own right but it, it is more a collection of songs there really isn't that continuity that kind of pulls it together necessarily sure if not thematically you know i think maybe maybe that sense of limitation is the theme that kind of runs through all the songs or the thread that runs through all the songs but you know we talk about it too i don't mean to um you know like butt in but this one really i don't know it just felt like a jam to me i i I would agree it feels a little more jammy uh, and same type of thing it's not my favorite song on the album, not my least favorite song on the album. It falls somewhere in the middle for me. I do know that uh, Dave Wiener played on, I, and I'm pretty sure it was this song, but if you don't uh, follow Dave Wiener, he has been Steve Vai's touring guitarist for a 20 num- years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since, Jeez. you know, I think since he was right out of college, but uh, obviously a very talented musician in his own right, puts out a lot of cool content. Uh that plays a lot of PRS, Friedman, Good Tone. Uh, check him out if you haven't. But I saw a post on his Facebook page that he had played, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was on Sandman and Cloud Mist. And it's like, okay, if he isn't noted in the liners, but he only played on one song, I'm wondering if 
maybe Steve I went through his Rolodex of world class musicians and kind of picked and choose. I mean, you know, uh, going back to the bass player point, I mean, he's got Philip Bino back with him again on the last couple tours after oh God, almost 20 years off, right? Because it was Billy Sheehan playing bass for a long time in that late 90s, you know, up through the mid uh, teens, I guess. Um, I know Stu Ham played for him back in the day, I think. Um, obviously, Anne Marie Calhoun on violin for a lot of that. But I'm curious, you know, out of all these musicians that he's played with, what what the composition was like and who he chose to play on what songs for what reasons. Like I could definitely tell, or I, I could see why you'd want Dave Wiener to play on a song like that. Cause I think in terms of what Dave excels at, not just in, in Vi's um, songwriting, but as a guitar player listening to him, there's a lot of really cool, I'd say more traditional sounding by comparison with Steve Vai, right? More traditional sounding rock type of playing both in tone and phrasing mm -hmm. uh so i could definitely see why you'd want dave wiener playing on that song i'm just wondering who else is playing on this album that we yeah we don't know yeah about. exactly yeah to me you know it, it just it, i guess that's what kind of struck me especially coming off of uh you know the, the previous song it almost felt like that might have even been a more apt closer to me than uh sandman cloud mist mm -hmm. i just feel like the playing is great <clears throat> the tone is great so it's not a fault of any of the players. It's not that, you know, musically it isn't it isn't um, cohesive, I mm -hmm. guess. But to me, it, it just kind of sounds like an interlude almost. It doesn't really sound like the, the ending of the album, at least okay. at least to me, at least the album that I listened to. Um, and I don't know, I just, I, I felt it, it kind of meandered a little bit. So to me, um, I, I don't know, I, if I kept that on the record, I maybe would have placed it a little bit more towards the middle. Or I would have, you know, maybe swapped around a few things. Uh, but yeah, it, I actually would go as to say it was probably my least favorite on the record. Hmm, interesting. So, but um, not a bad song, but just not my favorite. Another interesting title on, on this album. Nothing. This album's full of really kind of fun, quirky titles for songs. I well, mean. yeah, my thing is now I'm uh, I'm waiting for the DiMarzio pickup called the Sandman Sandman Cloud <laughs> Mist. <laughs> so we'll see if, if Larry gets on that one. That'll be the, the next one. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, would you recommend Invalid? <laughs> <laughs> Invalid. <laughs> Jason, what? <laughs> I don't think I don't think Steve's at the point where he's putting out Invalid yet. Give him like maybe fifteen more years. Would, <laughs> would you recommend Inviolate? Yeah, I would. I mean, overall, I think this record to me, it's a statement that Vi's making, and I think it's a statement that very much is of the times. Like I said, I view this as as Vi's COVID record. It's his quarantine record. Mm -hmm. I don't think. This record necessarily has the aspirations to be, you know, the the closing chapter of his trilogy, or you know, it it just it has a different atmosphere to it, a different vibe. I mm -hmm. think it's very much a kind of pushing himself, being a little bit more loose in some regards, um, maintaining that kind of level of compositional tightness and excellence that he's kind of known for, but also, like you said too, I think that was a good way to put it, um, trying new things, mm -hmm. using new techniques, new instruments. Uh, jamming a little bit more having a little bit more of that kind of looser feel or stripping back the production i think it, it the record is is as about that approach as much as it is the songs themselves i think um so i would i would recommend it i think it's a good uh reminder to a lot of the modern musicians that kind of are operate in this sphere including ourselves that you know it's still important to focus on the songwriting it's important to focus on the melody um and focus on the journey, uh, not as much the destination, because uh, I think there's some there's some wisdom there that Vi is trying to impart on us as listeners and consumers of music that I think he does pretty effectively. I'd agree. Um, I'd also recommend it, and I think that you know it's it's not going to be an album, even though it is number one. I think on hard rock charts right now, which is awesome. Um, I don't think it's an album that everybody is going to latch onto or gravitate towards, but I think they should 
for, for different reasons. I feel like if you are a casual listener, if you're not a musician, and you've liked Steve's work in the past, that you're going to like this album a lot. It has a lot of those hallmarks, like we've been talking about for a long time now, that make a good Steve I album. And I think that if you are a musician, it's worth listening to, because there's a lot of things in here that, um, like you said, Steve can impart to different players, whether that's different ways to voice a traditional chord progression, whether that's paying an excessive amount of detail to the way you phrase a line, or you know how uh, how you would structure overall album flow, which is definitely something I feel like in 2022 is is lacking a little bit um, across the board. And that's not to say, oh, old man playing guitar, good young kids, bad. Like there's a ton of great players and great albums getting released. But I do think that uh, the album serves as a good reminder of a style from bygone years, and you know what. What the shreddy again, even though this isn't a shred album, but what the what a an instrumental out al- guitar album looks like when it's fully fleshed out and has a significant amount of attention paid to it in in that capacity. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, everybody, that's it. Thanks for checking out our little video. Uh, we'll keep these coming out as frequently as we can. Uh, if you have any thoughts on what you want to see reviewed in the future, any bands you want us to check out, leave it in the comments. Be sure to like, subscribe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.